Hey guys, my name is Eric, and today we're gonna to be talking about all of the things they don't tell you about what would happen if there was a civil war. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another Hatchcast episode. And today I'm going to be talking about all of the things that they don't tell you would happen if there was a civil war. Before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button, and also comment below what your thoughts are. Uh, and if you get something out of this video, share this video with a friend or family member, somebody that could benefit off the channel. It's a great way to support the channel for free. I want to give you guys a disclaimer before I get into this video. It's probably one of the heavier topics that I've talked about. It's not a very fun topic to talk about, but I think it's extremely necessary, especially if you're a prepared citizen or somebody that really takes training seriously. All of the things that would come with conflict, uh, it's important to know about and to be mentally prepared for that type of event and the things that come with that event. So um, just a disclaimer, there are some things in this video that are going to be pretty, pretty disturbing. Uh, so viewer discretion is advised. So one of the things that I see a lot, and this is going to be a little bit of a rant from me today, um, is I see a lot of comments and a lot of people who are training, and especially within this community, that are, you know, just worried about the future. Uh, and so am I. You know, who knows what's coming? Uh, the best thing that we can do is train and prepare and plan. Um, and one of the biggest things about training that I really love, and also about um, you know, owning gear and things of that nature is training and owning equipment and owning firearms is the best deterrent to war. Uh, and the reason why that is the case is because if there is a massively trained population that is very well equipped, um, we get a seat at the table. Uh, and now there's a lot of, you know, people that reference that one saying from that Japanese admiral that says, you know, in World War II, there is a gun behind every blade of grass. And that holds truth. You know, that literally affects decision making. You know, I'm going to think twice before I come and invade this country or, or do something nefarious uh, to attack the nation. But what we're talking about today is essentially civil conflict. And this is going to be so different than what we saw in the GWA. It'll be different um, in terms of what we would experience. And a lot of combat veterans from the GWA and even maybe in the Gulf War or the Vietnam War um, could tell you, hey, the combat type of scenarios and uh, things that you would experience would be similar, but it would be multiplied by a million because it would be here on our home turf. So we're going to talk about some of the things that, you know, Hollywood doesn't talk about that a lot of people in, you know, YouTube or stories or whatever glorify a lot of combat stories. And so it gets people jazzed up. And, you know, when I had uh, young guys that would were underneath me that I was training, you know, everybody's always amped up and ready to test out their skills, you know, like ready for that deployment. Um, but usually after the fact, they realize like, holy smokes, like war and conflict is terrible um, and nothing can mentally prepare you for it. You know, everybody reacts differently to, to combat and um, how they react and how, how, how well they fall back on their training. Uh, when it comes to combat, you're gonna fall back to your lowest level of training. Uh, that adrenaline kicks in, and uh, if you're not training very often, you're not going to be doing very well in terms of your performance in the moment, whenever that moment happens. Давай, 
Нормально все, никого не стреляй. Пошли. So I want to talk about things that, you know, maybe Hollywood doesn't show, maybe isn't really talked about on social media, but is the bru brutal reality of what we would experience here if we had a civil war here in the United States. Um, you know, I see it quite often, like, man, let's just get this over with, you know, when do the guns come out, all that type of rhetoric. Um, and I get it, you know. Um, I think that there is a, a time and a place for things, you know, every, you know, even in the Bible, it talks about there's a time for peace, there's a time for war, there's a time for happiness, there's a time for laughter, there's a time for sadness, there's a time for every season. Um, but it's good to talk about and be educated about the things in the, you know, the third, fourth order of effects that you would experience if there was a conflict here. I think it's one of those things that we don't really think about till hindsight, um, but it's good to mentally prepare for that and also understand that it's best to avoid war at all costs. Um, I'm not saying give up your freedoms or any of that stuff. In fact, you know, it, it shows that when that line is crossed, there is going to be immense sacrifice that needs to be had with full understanding of all that comes with it. Um, but it's good for us to be able to mentally prepare and understand that it's a serious thing um, when it comes to war. So one of the things that I was you know, kind of brainstorming and thinking about is the brutality that we would experience here in the States. Uh, in a conflict zone, it's, it's nasty. You know, you're going to see dead bodies. You're going to see dead animals. And uh, with that, you're going to see, you know, a lot of death. Uh, and it's not just dead combatants. You're going to see a lot of people who are innocent folks, dead civilians. Uh, who are just casualties of that conflict that you're going to see and witness those things. And there's a, there's a psyche change. There's almost that shock factor that happens when you see a dead body. It's literally burned and ingrained into your mind, into your memory. It's one of those things where you don't ever forget about it. Um, and so I think that's something that, you know, when we see like, oh, man, I saw a car wreck and I saw, you know, is, you don't ever forget. It's, it's unnatural for us to see death in that way. Uh, and so in a conflict zone, you're going to see death and brutality. And it's something that we witness, you know, you'll probably be recorded. You know, you'll probably see death recorded. We already see it now on X and things of that nature from the conflict over in Europe. The other thing is that death will be a very commonplace thing. Um, you'll see it so often that eventually the dead bodies don't really bother you anymore. Um, but down the road when the conflict is over, you know, 10, 20 years from now, those images will stick with you forever. And I think the, the part that's going to be the hardest is seeing innocent lives like children and seeing those who should not be affected by war, who should never experience war, you'll see death on that scale where you're going to see even, even kids or, or mothers or pregnant women, uh, even, even older folks who, who are dead and and death is everywhere, and they're a part of it. Um, and th that's the thing that, for me as a parent, I am fine, you know, dealing with all of that mental trauma of seeing death and seeing all that stuff. But understand, if conflict happens, it happens here at home. You know, our children will be, be part of that in terms of witnessing death. Um, you know, we try our best to shield our kids from all of that carnage and all of the, the nasty things in this world, but innocence is one of the first victims of war. And so you're going to see, you know, death on a very common scale where even your kids are going to be witness to it. They may even witness, uh, you know, friends or family members who die or, you know, are witness to the moments of death of somebody else. And there's going to be a mental click that you as a parent are going to have to deal with and try to figure out how to heal your child of that trauma, how to protect them as best you can from witnessing something as traumatic as, as watching someone die or seeing death all over, all over the place. The other thing about brutality is we're going to see, you know, on a civil conflict, because everything is so polarized, you most likely will possibly see crimes against humanity. You may see you know, a genocide or executions or, um, you know, a prisoner of war or a prisoner of that conflict that gets taken prisoner killed. Um, you might see unarmed people getting shot. 
that, that is something that is very common in a Civil War type of scenario. Uh, we see it throughout history. Uh, brutality is hand in hand um, with that conflict. Think about our own you know, Revolutionary War, our own conflict also in the Civil War. Um, there was death commonplace, you know, and there was a lot of innocent lives that were, that were sacrificed because of that conflict. The other thing in terms of brutality, with the crimes against humanity, you're also going to see things like we see in Mexico. Uh, I believe that we're going to see, you know, rape and abuse and, um, you know, uh, beheadings and some really gruesome things to kind of enforce psychological warfare on the other combatants on the battlefield. Uh, so you may see, you know, if there is no law enforcement, if there is no uh, rule of law, um, it's just kind of a wild combat zone, you're probably going to witness extreme atrocities like that in a civil conflict. There's a history of it throughout human history. Uh, we've always seen brutality on this scale. Um, and so we would be naive to think that in a civil war here in the States that we would not uh, experience that. You absolutely most likely will see crimes against humanity on that scale. And so that is something that I don't think we really think about, but we see it somewhat in Mexico with the cartel and all of these things happening also in Ukraine, like even, you know, Russians and Ukrainians doing it to each other where you just see heads on spikes and you see um, mutilations of bodies or executions of prisoners of war, like we're seeing it. Uh, but here on a civil conflict here in the States, not only will you see it, but your kids and your loved ones and your niece and your nephew and your, your little siblings, the children that are in your life may also be witness to that. As you're trying to protect your family, that might be something that they end up witnessing. And there's a mental trauma that you're going to have to help heal down the road uh, as a result of, of seeing that. I think that one of the things also that we, we forget about is uh, I, I remember, you know, being downrange. And also, even before I was in the military, I lived in third world countries for a little while. And um, it was it was crazy because your smell has a has a memory. You actually remember smells very distinctly, just like you can visually remember something. Um, you can always remember the smells, and it's usually never the good ones. You always remember the bad smells, like the, the smell of a burning body um, or burning rubber, like tires burning. It just never goes away. Um, or honestly, from Afghanistan, that HME type smell, that burnt HME type of odor um, is something that just sticks with you forever. But understand that there's going to be a lot of smells that you're going to experience here, and most of them are going to be really bad. Uh, the first one being rotting bodies. Like, you're going to smell death. And people are like, yeah, what is death? Death has a smell. It just smells like decay in this sour, pungent, hit-you-in-the-face type smell that you just can't get rid of it. It almost like you want to clean your nose out. Um, and so you're going to smell decay, decaying animals, decaying human bodies, um, burned human bodies, and the smell that comes with that, uh, burned electrical equipment like cars on fire and burned tires. Um, but the smell of smoke, burning bodies, burning flesh, you're going to experience all of that. Um, and also things rotting, uh, let alone, you know, rotting, you're going to have rotting trash, but there's also going to be rotting bodies. So just imagine if you ever go into a dumpster and you, you know, throw stuff away, how bad that smells. And that's just garbage. Uh, imagine now you have bodies rotting in the sun. Here in Florida, uh, we actually had, uh, there's this pond that's near here where I'm filming, and a bunch of tilapia uh, had, had died, and the smell was overpowering, the smell of all the dead fish, and it was, that's just fish. Uh, so imagine that, you know, you have vultures that would be scavenging the bodies, and, and even dogs, like, we all love our pets, but imagine, you know, you're going to see dogs probably running wild because those pets are now no longer going to have owners. Maybe their owners died, and now those pets are trying to survive, and they're eating the bodies that are left out because that's the only source of food that they can find. So you're going to witness that. You're going to, you're going to smell that. Um, the smell of infected amputations or injuries, you know, along with, you know, you're going to smell what if someone has an infected ligament from a gunshot wound, you're going to be able to smell that pungent smell. Uh, also, feces and body odors. Like, there's not going to be, like, times possibly to take showers all the time like you do now. Like, showers are probably going to become a luxury. If we lose the grid, we lose everything, um, you're probably going to stink. Like, you're going to smell really bad. And I think we don't, you know, for guys in the military, you've been out in the field for a long time, or maybe if you go out and camping a lot, or go on hunting trips and you come back and you smell pretty ripe, um, that will probably become commonplace because you're probably not going to have the opportunity to take a 
a shower very often unless you have a community with running water or a place to be able to dip down and you have good enough security where people can you know protect the perimeter while you're taking a quick you know bath or whatever or shower to clean yourself off you're going to smell pretty bad let alone not only are you going to smell bad but your clothes and your gear is going to stink pretty bad uh, so you're going to have that smell constantly around you or event essentially you're become numb to that uh, but the other one is also cigarette smoke um, you know, on deployments, everybody smokes cigarettes. Uh, and so I guarantee you, people are going to try to deal with stress in their own way. And a lot of guys, you know, smoke. So even if you're a dipper, you started smoking. So you're probably going to see a lot of people smoking just to try to ease that stress. Uh, so the smell of cigarette smoke along mixed with all those other smells. If you walk into an area that has a lot of death and carnage, uh, mix all that together. And that is something that will be burned into your memory if we had a civil war. The other thing also is not just the smells and the things that we're going to see, but also we're going to hear some noises that are also going to trigger that memory. Um, one of them is obviously we see a lot of guys in Ukraine and Russia, they have ear pro and wearing headsets. And a lot of guys here in the shooting community, you guys run your own headsets, things of that nature. Um, but maybe your batteries die, maybe something happens where you lose your headset or it's no longer working or it's no longer effective, and now you're hearing gunfire without any ear pro. Like, uh, and it's going to be deafening. You'll have tinnitus. You'll hear that constant ringing like I got. I got constant tinnitus. But you're going to hear gunfire. You're going to feel that overpressure um, from heavier equipment like machine guns or artillery. Um, and the other thing you're also going to hear is explosions and the incoming projectiles. Um, you know, we're seeing in Ukraine a lot of people, Russians and Ukrainians, that are dealing with pretty bad shell shock and extreme mental trauma just from drones, hearing drones flying over, and also hearing artillery. <laughs> Ну да, то есть поснимать там тяжеловато будет. Вот у них здесь. And that has a very distinct sound that can cause, you know, eventually you to have possibly post-traumatic stress from that, just from that sound, you know. Um, so hearing that incoming drone or that incoming artillery, um, hearing that ricochet from gunfire, it'll be pretty commonplace. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear those ricochets, you'll hear that explosions. The other things, though, that you're also going to hear is you're going to hear people screaming. Um, you know, there is something to be said as far as we are, as human beings, we're not meant to kill each other. It's unnatural. Um, it leaves a traumatic scar mentally on us. Um, but not just imagine your friends screaming, but also because the Civil War is here at home, family members who are screaming or children who are crying or screaming, and you're doing your best to try to, to help them or save them. What if there is an explosion or, uh, you know, maybe an innocent family is shot up thinking that they were combatants? Um, you're going to hear some pretty horrific things um, to include the screaming and the crying of those who are innocent or even those who are combatants that are um, begging to be either be put out of their misery, uh, begging for a loved one. Um, you know, I have kids and I've got a wife and to imagine them in a combat zone and imagine the exposure of all the type of stuff that I'm going to try to shield them from, let alone just protect them physically with my training. Um, you know, if something happened to my kids and, and they're suffering, I think that would damage me pretty bad, just like it would damage any parent. Um, but that's something that you would probably hear. And so it's one of those things where we look at, you know, the brutality of what we're going to see and smell and hear. These are all things that are not glorious. It's not cool. It's not fun. But it's the reality, the harsh reality that comes with conflict and especially civil conflict. There will be no Geneva Convention. There will be no uh, code of conduct uh, that will be enforced. Now, it would be recommended to follow, and, you know, 
follow the golden rule, but if it's a civil conflict, that's where you're going to see brutality on a scale like you've never seen before. Um, and some of the other things that we'll also witness is, and we don't really think about it, is also a lack of the basic necessities. Um, you know, think about when, you know, four years ago during 2020, when everybody was freaking out about toilet paper. Imagine people like that freaking out because they don't have basic necessities like food. So, you you know, there's a possibility that there's going to be people that don't have enough medical supplies. you got to think outside of this community. A lot of people in this community, in the training community, are probably thinking about, like, oh, I'll be fine. i got enough stuff for me. But we also have to think about the majority of the population doesn't think about this and doesn't have the capability to store up food. That paycheck pays for their next meal. Um, we have to think outside of that. And that's who is going to be involved in the conflict is people, everyday Americans, that uh, have never really thought to prepare for something like this. And so the other thing that you're going to have is a lot of those a lot of your fresh foods, your vegetables, your fruit, your produce, on a scale where you can just go to the grocery store, you can just buy that and come home and you got fresh food. Unless you have a garden, fresh food goes out the window. Everything will be canned or boxed or dried or freeze dried. Um, there's not going to be really any fresh food unless you have somebody who can go out and hunt. But you gotta think about a lot of people are gonna go off of preserved foods because that's the only thing that will last for a longer period of time. The other thing also is here in Florida, <laughs> Air conditioning is obviously going to be a luxury. Um, there's probably, if the grid goes down and everything goes, you know, crap hits the fan, you're probably going to have no electricity, which means you're not going to have any air conditioning. Um, or if you have AC in your car, that gas is probably really precious. So you're not going to run your car to be able to get some AC. Um, so there's possibly going to be a lot of heat that you're going to have to deal with. Or, um, you know, maybe you, don't, you need electrical heat because you're up north. Uh, and you don't have the ability to do that, so you have to start a fire. But starting a fire increases your signature and, and the risk of you being found. So you may not be able to start a fire. Uh, you might just have to you know, bundle up with some warmer clothes until you can go somewhere more secure where you have the ability to start a fire without being attacked or uh, raided or whatever. Um, the other thing also is we won't have any entertainments. Like We think about how much you are addicted to our phones and we have all of these little luxuries that we have these the entertaining things on our phone you got your ps4 your ps5s all of your your gaming systems um you know board games like there's probably going to be minimal to no entertainment uh nothing to kind of preoccupy your mind and that's where it's like you might have books um you might have uh maybe like a card game but those little small things, those middle, little small things really are important because it boosts your morale. And especially in a time where everything is miserable, any little bit of morale boost or reminder of the comforts of home is going to be huge. The other thing also is we're going to lose all of our pastimes. Um, all the family traditions that you have, that's going to be you know, with you in terms of if you pass that on to your kids and hopefully their, your kids will pass it on to their kids. Um, you know, you're going to lose all those pastimes, all those memories. Um, so make those memories now. Hold on to those times with your kids and, and the, the, the times that you spend with your family. Um, really hold on to those because if everything collapses and society completely craps, you're going to have to rebuild from somewhere and you're going to have to pull from that stock of old memories and old traditions and things of that nature to kind of um, rebuild from the ashes. The other thing also is, you know, clean laundry is going to be a luxury. Uh, you know, my mom, she, you know, you know, grew up in Korea, and back then they didn't have a washing machine. They just literally, all the women would go down to the river and literally have scrubbing boards and scrub all the clothes and clean all the clothes. Uh, so you're not going to have a laundry machine or a washer. You're probably going to have to scrub down by the river. Hopefully you got a body of water or... Um, you know, have multiple sets of fresh clothes that you can kind of go through. But, um, yeah, you won't be able to have, have the ability to just throw stuff in the wash and throw some soap in there and call it a day and throw it in the dryer. Like, it, it's going to be a process just washing your laundry and uh, making sure that you have your hygiene good. The other thing is also get used to walking. Uh, there probably will not be a lot of vehicles being used if we have no access to gas or gas after three months is pretty much all gone. Uh, not a lot of diesel stuff out there. Um, or at least as much as like regular gas cars. So um, 
you know, you probably will have to be walking everywhere. Uh, so, you know, the luxury of just getting in a vehicle and driving where I want to go, it's only five miles down the road. Now that five miles becomes quite a hike. Um, and the other thing also is we have our homes and we have the comforts of where we live. But if you have, especially in Florida, if you have no AC for 24 hours or maybe a week, you have mold growing inside that home. And that mold eventually starts to get on all your stuff, makes you sick. It's really not good for your health. Uh, and it really can pollute a lot of things. The reason why I say this, and a lot of these things that we obviously already know, but we're just not thinking about it at the forefront of our minds, is because we here in America have a lot of comforts. We have a lot of luxuries. We are, we are seriously blessed with a lot of the things that we have. Um, I had the privilege and the opportunity to live in some third world nations before the military. And even those who have lived in a third world nation, or maybe during the GWAT you went to Iraq or you were in Afghanistan, or maybe you got a deployment to Africa, we really don't understand true poverty. And I mean poverty on a, on a human scale that is just terrible. Um, there is this one time I lived overseas, and, and this is in Asia, and um, I remember I had just gotten to this country, and there was this kid. He was probably about five years old, and he's in the middle of the city square, and he's got this mat out. He's missing his leg. He's missing an arm. He literally has just a crutch that he uses to, to get around everywhere. Um, and he would drag himself to different sections of the mat, but he had a little basket. And at the time, I couldn't read the language. Uh, and so I was about to give this kid some money because uh, my buddy was telling me, and I assume, and he, I was like, hey, what's that sign say? And he's like, oh, he needs money for, you know, a prosthetic and, and to go to school and, and stuff like that. So he's begging for money for school. So I'm like, I get, get ready to give him some money. And my buddy's like, no, don't do that. Um, you know, it's a setup. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, let's just go grab something to eat across the street, and we'll just watch. So we went to across the street and uh, just grabbed some food, and I'm sitting there watching this kid. My heart is just broken for him. Um, you could just see he was just dirty and just nasty. He just had a pair of old worn shorts. Um, and I saw this dude come by and grab all the money out of the basket and then put it in his pocket and walk away. And the kid looked like he was nervous around the guy. Um, and this happened every hour on the hour. This guy would come by and he'd go back and he'd pick up the money and then he'd put it in his pocket and leave. Um, and I asked my buddy, I was like, who's that guy? And he's like, dude, that's, his, that's most likely his parents. They had taken their child and amputated two of their limbs so that way they could use the kid to beg for, for money. Um, and to realize like on a scale to be in such a level of poverty where people have the inhumanity to do that, it, it shook me. It shook me bad. Um, There's another guy who had, you know, missing legs, and he literally would drag himself. He had strapped two-by-four blocks, like these wooden blocks to his arms, and he would drag himself to the middle of the city square to beg. And so when I say that we are truly blessed, we have so many comforts, um, what worries me is in a civil conflict is all those, all those things would be stripped away. Um, if you look at Hurricane Katrina, you know, think about New Orleans, how quickly a first world nation quickly devolved in about the span of a week into a third world nation where people are, you know, pooping out in the streets and there's dead bodies everywhere and the smell is just terrible and there's, there's crime that's happening at a really rampant scale where the National Guard was needed to be able to try to control things and even they were having a hard time. Um, and so we think so much that it does, it can't happen to us. Uh, all of the horrible things that you see out in the world can happen to us, but we have to remember we're human, right? We, we've been blessed with a lot of luxuries, um, and we've also been blessed with the opportunity to get a lot of stuff and to provide a lot for our families and to raise our kids up in a protected environment and give them a good education, a real education, and, and really give them a lot of the things that most people around the world don't have. And so, you know, when when the way that things are headed right now, I get it. You know, I really do. I just think it's important for us to also remember and to realize that when things happen, we need to be mentally prepared for the effects from that event. Um, if there is a civil war, if there is a collapse, if there is that, um, you know, we need to be ready mentally and physically and with our skills and also having these talks with your your family and just real serious talks like hey here's how it will be 
and maybe developing some sort of plan to be able to be ready for that, um, to be able to be ready to handle that trauma that your kids are probably going to experience. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a possibility of civil war. You may lose your loved ones. You may lose your kids or your spouse. Like that is a very high possibility in a civil war type scenario. You know, are you ready for something like that? And these are things that we have to all be thinking about. It's so easy to think about it on a, yeah, I'm training all the time and um, kind of almost get excited about it. I get it, you know. Uh, I've seen a ton of guys that are super prepared and have a lot of skills and things of that nature, but we have to also be thinking about the second, third, fourth order of effects that would occur because of a civil conflict. And these aren't popular topics, guys. Like these are things that are just really hard to think about. Nobody wants to think about their kid witnessing something traumatic or uh, losing a loved one. Nobody wants to think about that. But that is the harsh reality if we do encounter a conflict. And the question is, is are you ready for that? And so, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk, you, talk to you guys about is understand if you lose a family member, even when it's not a conflict, there are times where you lose your job you know, during this time where there is no conflict. Sometimes it feels like there can be no hope. Uh, and, and in a time of complete collapse, there's definitely going to be not a lot of hope left around. Um, but I want to kind of give you guys this encouragement. And this came to me from Ephesians chapter 6. And I just want to read this to you guys, even if you're not a believer. And I'll talk to you about that. But the Word of God and the Bible and Jesus, when He died on the cross and rose again, He gave us hope and fulfillment. And the Bible really is a book that is full of hope. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying, key word, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. This is Paul who's writing this that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. I've got two messages. One of them is, if you are a believer, put on that whole armor of God. If you are a believer, the time to be able to stand up and deliver that hope is now. If you have somebody that you know that is struggling, uh, if you know someone in your family or a loved one who is really struggling or, or a friend maybe or a co-worker, the time to be bold is now. Be bold and talk to that person. Witness to that person. Tell them about the hope that they can have in God. Dude, I would be so selfish if I kept all of this for myself. If I just didn't open my mouth because I was too nervous about what people would think of me, the world has done a really good job of making it making talking about hope in Jesus offensive. And it's not. Dude, it's changed my life. Why would I want to hold this from somebody? Why would I not want to tell somebody about the fulfillment that I have now? You know, it took years. I grew up in the church and I, I never had fulfillment because I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. But once I had a relationship with him, dude, it, it literally blew me away. It changed my life, man. It gave me fulfillment on a scale. It gave me hope that even if stuff comes, even if stuff collapses, I still have that hope in Christ. I still have that security that Jesus is looking out for me and my family. And even if I die, even if I do lose my life, I know where I'm going. I know I get to spend eternity with him in a new heaven and a new earth, in a life that we get to live with him forever and with all of our brothers and sisters. And so this is something that is 
is something I want you guys to think about. And for those who aren't believers, if you don't know who Jesus is, man, I am telling you, it has changed my life. There is fulfillment on a scale that you could receive in Jesus. He died for you. He has been waiting your whole life for you. He has so much love for you, even though you may not know him, or may you, maybe you haven't accepted his love, but he still loves you. And he's not gonna force you to love him. He's not gonna force you to be with him. You know, it's like if, if I was in a marriage and I was forcing my wife to be with me and I was buying her all this stuff and I was buying her a new car and all these types of things and, and she still cheated on me, I can't force her to love me. The love has to happen because the other person is willingly giving that love back to me. And that's the same with God, man. Like he loves you so much, but you have to willingly give that love back to him. He's not gonna force you to do it. And so for me, you know, I, I know that I've been talking about the Lord a lot and I just, I do it because I love you guys. I love you, the Barrel and Hatch community. I wanna serve you. And that's how for, for us as believers to have a, a relationship with Jesus and also to be a, a soldier for the kingdom of heaven God calls us to serve. God came to the earth, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Dude, he could have come back as God. He is the creator of the universe. He could have come back on a throne with his massive army of angels and be like, yo, I'm back, I'm coming. And he is gonna come back one day. But dude, he came back and he washed people's feet. He healed the sick. He came back and he was a servant. And so God has called all of us Christians to serve, to be of service to you to serve, you know, and, and to, to take my ego and put it away. My hope for this channel is that I become less and God becomes more. That I don't become the, the face that everybody sees. I want God to be the face that you guys see. That you see Jesus and that you find him and find that fulfillment because that's the only thing that will carry you through if everything collapses. All the traumas that we'll experience, there's healing power in God, man. And so, for those of you who are struggling out there, for those of you who need prayer, comment it below. If you are a Christian, look at the comment section. If you see one that's struggling and putting up a prayer request, pray for them. If you are curious about who Jesus is and want to know who God is, email me at team at barrelandhatchet.com. Or if you're a Christian and you have a testimony that you'd like to share, share it with us. Or you can email me at team at barrelandhatchet.com. I'd love to hear from you. Guys, a great way to support the channel is obviously come train with us. Go to barrelandhatchet.com and sign up for a training class and come train with us. But even more so, equip yourself with the Word of God. And if you don't know who Jesus is, know Him, man. He's been waiting for you your whole life. And so for, this, for the ending of this video and probably the ending of every video from here on out, I want to give you guys this mantra. When I stand before Jesus on that day when it's just me and Him, and we are looking back at my life, or you're standing with him, and you're looking back at your life, I want all of us to be able to boldly tell God in confidence this verse. And this is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Guys, gals, Train to be the eternal asset. Live to serve others, and I will see you on the next one.